Hi everyone, my name is Annabeth Robertson. I'm a second year student at the Brody School of Medicine and one of the co-chairs at the Greenville Community Shelter Clinic. My fellow co-chair Grant O'Brien and I have been working on a project that utilizes telehealth to keep the shelter clinic open during the pandemic. When COVID-19 hit back in March, our world as we know it went virtual. Classes were now online, meetings were virtual, and even family gatherings were happening over Zoom. People were going out and buying new technology. Students were being sent laptops by their schools so that they could tune in remotely. However, this new way of life wasn't accessible for everyone. Take for example, the homeless population. The homeless have been among the most vulnerable throughout this entire pandemic. Not only do they not have access to computers, many of them don't have access to telephones and don't have the ability to tune into virtual doctor's appointments like a lot of the world has during this time. They're also most vulnerable to chronic conditions and infectious diseases such as COVID, influenza, and hepatitis A. When the pandemic started, us medical students were pulled from all clinical spaces. We were no longer able to meet patients face-to-face, -face, which meant we were no longer able to volunteer at the shelter and it had to be closed. Because of this, we immediately piloted a prescription refill program that allowed us to fill vital medications for our patients during this time. The way that it worked was that our shelter residents would fill out a request form with the shelter staff for a, a prescription. Then they would email that over to us and we would access their electronic health record. And then we would communicate with one of our volunteer physicians who would help us get the prescriptions refilled. The next day we would go pick up these medications from the pharmacy and drop them off at the shelter the next day. This model worked well for a while. However, a few months into it, we realized that our patients needed more. Due to them being homeless, they face a number of social determinants of health that affect their chronic health conditions, but a lot of them also have mental health conditions. Because of this, we realized we really needed to be able to talk to our patients to give them the best care possible. We had many meetings with our board team. We met with school and university administration in order to come up with a plan that we felt was the most effective while keeping everyone safe. And we ultimately settled on telehealth. To begin our model, we needed to secure technology. So we were able to get two iPads donated, one from Access East and one from the Service Learning Distinction Track Program at the Brody School of Medicine. The way that our model works is that our social worker, Jessica, is at the shelter in person. She'll, in full PPE, she'll greet our patients, take their vital signs, and help get them set up on one of the iPads. And then using Microsoft Teams, the rest of the team, including students, pharmacy representatives, and physicians are able to tune in virtually. With a series of different breakout rooms on Microsoft Teams, we can help the patient encounter run pretty smoothly. First, one of us medical students will meet with a patient in a room, we'll interview them, take their medical history. Then after that, we'll jump into another room with the physicians, present to them. Finally, the two of us will hop back into the patient room, debrief with the patient, make sure they have any prescriptions or any resources that they need. This model has been working well so far. We've successfully hosted five different clinics. We've been able to serve a total of 12 different patients and fill 38 prescriptions using this model. We've gotten pretty decent feedback from the patients using a basic Likert scale. They've rated that they find telehealth helpful and that they would participate in another telehealth visit with a provider. Like any new model, you're going to face roadblocks. One of the biggest challenges that we face have been some internet connectivity issues over at the shelter. We didn't have a great connection and it was a bit difficult to hear the patients and find out everything that they needed. So because of this, at our last clinic last week, we made some changes. Now we have Jessica, our social worker, and our physician at the shelter in person. So they're able to serve the patients while the rest of the team is still able to participate and tune in virtually via Microsoft Teams. We've really enjoyed getting to meet our patients where they are and see them face to face. Um, we couldn't do any of this that we do without our team. We have a wonderful team of volunteer physicians, pharmacy representatives and residents and fellow medical students. 
Volunteering at the Greenville Community Shelter Clinic has been one of the most rewarding parts of my medical school career so far. I've learned so much from the patients and I've gotten to meet so many wonderful people. I know that myself and the rest of our team continue being able to serve in this capacity until we're able to meet our patients face to face again. Thank you. Hello, I am Chantel Cheek, Director of Uninsured Programs with Access East and Vitant Health. Um, today, I will be discussing our farm worker initiative that um, reached the camps and farms and some of the migrant families during the COVID pandemic. Um, our program ran, was started really in March or April, um, and it's ongoing, but some of the numbers I'll be sharing with you are from March or April to the end of last year in December. Our farm worker program covers all of Eastern North Carolina with um, a special focus on some of the more inland counties here in the East. We have two very fluent um, bilingual navigators um, and employees in our office. We have Juan Allen and Lori Elwell. Juan is a navigator and Lori is a patient advocate and they were, they were really responsible for um, our program and making sure that it ran effectively. And they're also responsible for how well everything turned out for us. Um, one and Access East has had a farm worker program for some years now. We were just able to expand on Juan's relationships with growers um, and community organizations and with the state to really address the pandemic and to be sure that those working in the farms had the education that they need, the testing that they need, and some of the follow-up as it related to COVID. So um, we had a partnership with UNC Chapel Hill um, and also Rail Care, um, another nonprofit, to actually go out to the farms to do COVID testing. Um, this sort of allow, well, this did allow for us to reduce the transportation barriers um, and to be sure that we addressed all questions. Um, we did the testing right then and there and also provided education while we were on site. One worked diligently with um, growers um, and other community organizations such as Kinston Community Health, um, the Office of Rural Health, and others to be sure that we hit hot spots and made sure that we went to those farms and camps where maybe they were concerned about having a COVID outbreak or that we were just trying to prevent an outbreak just because of their location to some of the other outbreaks that have been going on in the region. Um, because of our efforts, really Juan and Lori, um, we were able to provide education, be it um, signage, we provided handouts and also one-on-one -on -one education in um, Spanish. And it, it really allowed for increased understanding and also to break down um, any language barriers and also build a rapport with the farm workers and their families. Um, our program was able to touch over 2000 farmers and growers and their families with education. Um, especially with some yard signs. We had over 100 camps display our COVID yard signs with the Vitant COVID line number. So they could call that number, speak with someone about test results, or if they just had follow-up questions. They also had um, Juan's phone number. So if it was a time that on the weekend where they had a question or a grower was concerned, somebody started to display symptoms, Juan was readily available to answer their questions and provide um, feedback for them. We were also able to utilize the um, Biden truck, uh, marketing truck with the COVID signs and symptoms that drove by the farms to display information in Spanish. Um, we had over 400 farmers um, and the growers receive um, life-saving information that we know we personally touched 
to be sure that COVID and the pandemic didn't run away or run through the camp. Um, we also had 60 farm workers get signed up for health insurance through our health insurance marketplace and our ACA program. So this allowed for the farmers, if they had any kind of issue where they had to be hospitalized, the hospital was able to be reimbursed um, and not um, use charity care for, for their care. So in all, um, I think we did a really good job addressing the pandemic and we see continued work this year because we know the pandemic is still here and we will continue to work with our regional partners and our state partners to be sure that we address the most vulnerable of our population. Hi everyone, my name is Anoki Patel and I'm a third year hematology oncology fellow here at ECU. And today I'm going to be talking about assessing the psychological effects of COVID-19 in cancer patients. So stress, anxiety, and depression are all neuropsychiatric illnesses that are common to cancer patients. And as we can see here through this diagram, there are many different pathways that can contribute to this. But unfortunately, a lot of the times these go undiagnosed and are often neglected. So statistics show that 47% of cancer patients are at risk for depression, but unfortunately only about two thirds of them receive the appropriate, appropriate mandated distress screening and follow up. So that leaves us with a little more than one third of patients that do not have the appropriate screening. The 2020 National Cancer Survey looked at how the COVID pandemic has impacted cancer patients. And in this, we can see that 45% of the participants felt that the pandemic has had a negative impact on their mental health. 42% wished they had more emotional support during the pandemic. 58% of people reported they had to make sacrifices in their daily lives. 81% of people reported limiting their contact with others to reduce the risk of contracting the virus. And black people with cancer were also more likely than white people with cancer to say that they've had to make a significant sacrifice due to the pandemic. So we aimed to recreate a similar study here in Eastern North Carolina to assess how COVID has impacted our cancer patient population. We created an IRB approved survey and had patients age 18 or older who were being treated at Vitamin Medical Center for either a solid or hematologic malignancy. Patients were either on active treatment or surveillance at the time of the survey. We also use three validated screening tools, the DAS-21, which assesses depression, anxiety, and stress, WHO5, which is a well-being index, BRS, the brief resilience scale, which measures a patient's ability to cope during difficult situations, and then there is a subset of investigator-created questions relating to changes in behavior during the pandemic. Our endpoints were to assess rates of anxiety, stress, depression, and overall well-being, as well as assess for any significant behavioral changes due to the pandemic. So the study was started in December of 2020, and so far we have accrued about 56 participants. There's an equal distribution amongst black patients and white patients. There is a slight predominance of males of 31 patients to 25 female patients. Um, there was 47 patients with a solid malignancy diagnosis, nine patients with the hematologic, 45 patients were on active treatment, and 11 patients were on surveillance. So this is a preliminary data looking at the breakdown of the DAS-21, which looks at, at stress, anxiety, and depression. And as we can see, most of the scores tend to fall on the left side of the graph indicating low scores. Patients that did have higher scores were referred appropriately to our navigators and social workers for further intervention. The WHO is scored on a, on a scale of zero to 100%, 100% indicating optimal well-being. On average, most of, uh, on average, the score was 67% in this in this group. The BRS looks at the brief resilience um, is a brief resilience scale, and it measures resilience in patients one being low resilience and five being optimal resilience. And the average score on this was four. In terms of behavioral related questions, there were a few expected and a few unexpected findings. 92% of patients reported having enough family support to help through this time. 92% also reported having decreased the amount of contact with friends and family. 
Uh, interestingly, about 20% did report they do leave their house to attend religious services, and 70% do still leave their homes to buy their own groceries. Interestingly, only 11% reported ever considering delaying an office visit or infusion visit due to the COVID pandemic. So we know there are several limitations to our study, the foremost being the sample size. We only have 56 patients accrued so far, but we do continue to um, actively recruit. Other ethnicities were also excluded uh, due to the language barrier. However, we know this is not an accurate representation of the, our entire patient population. There were no baseline assessments of stress, anxiety, depression, resilience, and overall well-being. Also, the three um, screening tools we implemented usually measure the patient's response over the past one to two weeks, and we know the pandemic has been around for much longer than that. Um, and lastly, there were some overall barriers to participation. So moving forward, we do plan to continue recruiting patients into our study. Um, we will continue to use our navigators psychology and psychiatry colleagues, as well as our social workers. And we may consider the addition of a follow-up survey to assess change in scores over time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Holly Ingram, and I'm a medical student at the Brady School of Medicine. I'm presenting our project today on the development and institution of a virtual platform for the physiology camp. What we traditionally did was bring models and simulation equipment to K-12 students and after-school care programs. We offered healthcare career exposure as well as mentoring, and we had a focus on underserved communities, but anyone who wanted us to come and visit, we tried to, we tried to oblige. We also had a focus on Eastern North Carolina in cities such as Greenville, New Bern, and Goldsboro. So timeline-wise, we started in 2013, and then each year we kind of expanded what we were doing. In 2018, we had a formal evaluation process that basically showed that the students really enjoy learning about the different healthcare, healthcare career fields. They enjoyed interacting with the ECU students, both undergrad as well as the graduate students in med school, dental school, physical therapy, and so forth. And they also really enjoyed the hands-on aspect of the camp and getting to work with the models and moving around was also an important factor. Parents had an, reported an overall improvement of their child's uh, school performance, and then volunteers reported that smaller group learning was best, and then having a structured curriculum to follow during the camps was very helpful. We, of course, we use these evaluations to continuously improve the camp, and then COVID happened, and we kind of had to reassess everything. So what was needed, and then what could we do? So we decided we could do telecamps and teletutors. Telecamps is essentially what we were doing in person, but online. And then teletutors is we were also tutoring in person at the time as a separate program. And then that was also transitioned to online. This talk though focuses on telecamps. So once we decided what we were doing, how were we going to do it? Who were we gonna reach out to? Where were we gonna offer this? And when was it gonna be offered? So in terms, of, in terms of how we were doing it, we had to first do a lot of research. You know, what was done in the past? What is suggested for online curriculum? What's the attention span of an elementary student versus a high school student? And then safety-wise, how is that different in person versus online? And then what similar programs have been done before that we can use that, their information to apply to our program? And of course, this wasn't a one-time thing. This was continuously referenced throughout the process. So we had a team of about 20 individuals who were previously used to implement the physiology camps. Due to COVID, the, their time commitments of each individual kind of changed, and we had to reassign the position since what you're doing in person is kind of different than what you would be doing online. So we had to reassign all of the positions and kind of redesign a core structure of what we were doing. We also had to talk with our stakeholders. What did they think was important? What was their input on what we were doing? And then we actually had to do the design. <laughs> and that just basically had a lot of details and then more details. We essentially decided, decided on live video interactions was the best way to go about it, and recording them was important for safety. The teacher to student ratio that we found in the research that was best was one to four, since more students than that had a lower yield of interaction, and then less students than that, the students tended to be a little bit more shy. New materials and games were developed. For example, instead of, uh, instead of using a heart monitor in the camps, we online did uh, running in place and then feeling your heartbeat afterwards. We also encourage them to feel the different pulses across the body. Or another example is using a flashlight on their phone, for example, to look at the eye reflexes. And they can do that at home and then we can 
kind of guide them on how to do that over video. So different interaction, interactive and activities like that were implemented in the online curriculum. And then also the sign up was different because previously we went to them. Now they're having to come to us and sign up. So that was different. How we held the set times were different because it was first come first serve. And previously we we're doing K through 12 and now we're transitioning back to only doing high school students due to the new format and the preliminary aspect of everything. Then we had to figure out how we were gonna advertise because previously we only advertised to volunteers and now we're also advertising to volunteers and participants. We decided to stick to just North Carolina like we previously did and then as well as talking to our key stakeholders. Eventually we decided to also advertise though across the US to get just more volunteers to ensure we had enough to, to satisfy who, however many students decided to sign up for the program. So far, we, we recently started a couple months ago, and we have seven high school students signed up and six graduate volunteers. There's two sessions with positive responses so far, and the positions have been filled for all of the remaining sessions for next semester. In terms of making a virtual platform, of course, it required a lot of persistence, teamwork, and communication, we found. The main lessons that we learned though were the legal considerations such as like online recording and background checks, the sign up process and how that was different for participants versus volunteers and the importance of advertising for that, as well as a restructuring in the communication aspect was different. And then of course, as mentioned before, the multimodal features in terms of creating animations, noises, Q&A games and interactions in the environment. Thank you so much for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kirsten Beasley, and I'm the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator for the counties of Martin Terrell and Washington. I'm very excited to be here to talk about emergency preparedness for rural communities and how to do this safely and effectively in the midst of a global pandemic. Before we jump right in, let's talk about what kinds of emergencies we plan for in rural Northeastern North Carolina. We can expect hurricanes, floods, and storm surges, tornadoes, and earthquakes that lead to widespread power outages. We also prepare for fire and winter storms. All these severe weather storms can cause widespread power outages, damaging winds, and injuries. Some geographic challenges that rural communities in the Northeast face are high risk for storm surge and flood in designated Zone A areas. Majority of our coastal counties are Zone A and will be evacuated first if a major hurricane is approaching. Some counties, like Hyde County, have a wide geographic span with a very small population. Limited public transportation or just inaccessibility for those who live in the outskirts. And finally, distance to retail venues where supplies, food, and water can be purchased. Now that we've talked about types of emergencies that we prepare for and some of those geographic challenges, let's talk about what role a pandemic plays in when preparing for these emergencies. Typically during hurricane season, we begin going over plans for shelters. However, in the midst of a pandemic, we try to avoid opening shelters and putting many people in a very small enclosed area where the virus can spread rapidly. If evacuation is necessary, we encourage people to use hotels or stay with family members in non-evacuation zones. In cases of extreme emergency, we can open a shelter and take precautions such as temperature checks, keeping family members together, and designate areas with privacy curtains and distribute masks and hand sanitizers. One of the biggest challenges we face in connecting with our rural communities in Washington and Terrell counties is that 60% of households have broadband internet. Therefore, we can't solely rely on social media to educate and inform our community members. Other ways we connect and engage with our community members is by finding what's meaningful to them. Another great platform we use to reach our members is local news stations. Many households still watch the local news stations and interviews are always free. Of course, if you do have the money to spend, billboards and commercials are always sure to reach people and you can track the number of people who see them. So do you need a different type of kit for each emergency or just one? The answer is if you plan your kit well, you only need one. You wanna include items in your kit for survival, like enough food and water for three days, emergency rescue blankets, and medication. 
I also highly recommend including cloth or disposable mask, hand sanitizer, and gloves to help prevent the spread of viruses like COVID-19 or the flu. At the Martin Terrell Washington District Health Department, we have a program called Be Aware and Prepare. This project primarily serves the elderly population that makes up 22.8% of our residents. This population may face challenges such as transportation, not being aware of how to prepare for an emergency, living alone, having no access to broadband internet, or living in secluded areas. We also primarily serve vulnerable populations that may live in high poverty areas who can't afford a kit. Our kits come in waterproof bags that contain supplies to decrease the spread of coronavirus if families do need to evacuate and seek shelter. They also come with uh, glow sticks, thermal blankets, um, and several of the items listed here on the slide. For our residents with transportation barriers, we're able to deliver these kits directly to their homes. We also educate about preparing for an emergency and promote these kits using our social media, flyers in the community, and at our local news stations. This year, we were very grateful not to have any major emergencies that required us to open shelters or evacuate our residents. And I'd like to close by saying thank you to everyone for listening. This pandemic has certainly challenged each and every one of us in a way that we do our work and has forced us to think outside the box. I'm always here to answer questions or just brainstorm through some challenges you may be experiencing. My contact information is on this slide. Thank you for listening and have a great rest of your symposium. Good morning, my name is Jacob Parrish. I'm here representing Vita Health. I'm honored and excited to be a part of the 2021 Rural Health Symposium and uh, to describe a little bit about our partnership with NCDHHS as it relates to COVID-19 testing and increasing access to testing for the high priority and marginalized population uh, that we serve. A little bit about Vita Health first. Um, this is the area that we serve for the state. We refer to it as Eastern North Carolina, the 29 counties of Eastern North Carolina. Geographically, it's the size of the state of Maryland and only has a one and a half million people in it. So by default, it is rural for sure and certainly has a lot of all the, the rural challenges that go along with, with rural America. Uh, the mission for Vita Health is to improve the health and well-being for, of Eastern North Carolina. And I can tell you, uh, being a team member for over 20 years, uh, this is what we strive for every day, whether it's normal primary care, cardiac care, women's and children's care, rehab, and now pandemic, uh, we do show up every day striving to meet that, that mission. And the vision, our partnership with uh, Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University is critically important to creating that premier trusted uh, healthcare delivery and education system. Uh, this is a quick visual to show uh, that we have a footprint all over the, uh, Eastern North Carolina, which allows us to render the services that, that are available. Um, in terms of uh, the demographics of Eastern North Carolina, we're challenged out the gate, right? This shows 2009 to 2013 percent of non-white individuals across the East. The darker the county, the, the higher the minority population. This is the exact reason the CHAMP initiative came along, uh, was to help increase testing in these environments. Any indicator you look at um, shows that the East is more challenging, including this one, which is our county distress rankings. Eastern North Carolina is full of tier one counties, which is all about uh, income, population, tax base, so on and so forth. So we are challenged proportionately differently than the rest of the state. This brings me to CHAMP. So on June 26, DHHS released an RFP looking for a partner to provide uh, PCR COVID-19 testing in the uh, marginalized population. The importance of this timeline is the timeline. It was released on a Friday. We responded the following Wednesday. We were awarded on Friday and we had to be live the following Wednesday. So this entire initiative occurred um, basically in a week, week and a half, including the weekend to make sure that we can mobilize our resources for that. This is a zip code map of North Carolina. This is how the state identified the areas that they wanted to go into. Um, the colors are different vendors that were tapped, but if you were to think about overlaying that 29 county map onto this, we had all of the green and orange zip codes in the, uh, in the east that we were responsible for. From that, we had a massive outreach campaign. Again, when you're targeting a population who historically has a lack of trust for the health 
delivery system, you know, commercials and billboards don't get it. You have to get out into the community. You have to get into the faith community, your, your local government officials, so on and so forth. And we even launched a separate website we called Vidit Verified, which targeted, um, you know, minority populations and Latin populations, because there was so much information out there about COVID, nobody was really sure what information to believe. So if we had the Vidit logo on it, we wanted you to know that that information had been verified. From that, we had an outreach uh, specific to our Latin community as well, because we knew out the gate that that was the population we really needed to target to get testing. We set up a process. Um, you could show up at one of our locations. You were registered. We collected a specimen on you, uh, gave you some patient information or patient education materials, and then you got your results within 24 hours via a phone call or my chart message, depending on if you had access to that. Um, a picture's worth a thousand words. It took an army to pull this off across Eastern North Carolina. And some of the church pictures you see in the bottom is what I'm talking about. We're on dirt roads at the end of a path under a tailgate tent is what we were doing. This was not inside the walls of Vidit Medical Center. This was truly out in the community, whether Gaston, Rich Square, Canada, Pine Tops, and so on and so forth. We really had to get out and drum up uh, trust in the community to, to test these patients. We did 141 of these in a six week period. We contributed to more than half or almost half of the state's goal all here in the east. So if you go back to the zip code map, we were only a portion, but we were able to achieve almost half of the state's goal, which we're very proud of. And the partnership with Access East, Hill Thy Neighbor, and Mexican were all key uh, to achieving that. From there, we collected at almost 4,100 people. 5100 5,400 people um, with about a 7% positivity rate, which is what we've seen across the board. But I'd like to point out our Latinx population, 19% positive. This was the indicator of why this work was important, to get into the marginalized populations, get them access to testing, provide patient education, and help them understand to control the virus and prevent spread. My name is Kay Craven. I'm the Director of Nutrition Services for ECU Physicians. Nutrition services are typically provided in face-to-face -face individual appointments or in group classes. After an individual face-to-face -face visit, studies have shown that patients can be successfully supported in their dietary change efforts by telephone, telehealth, mail, by email, or even text. Lack of reimbursement for delivering care other than face-to-face -face, has slowed the adoption of alternative care delivery. About half of U.S. adults have a diet-related chronic disease that can be better managed by following a special diet, yet only about 17% are following a special diet on any given day. Barriers to receiving nutrition therapy support before COVID, including lack of transportation, lack of reimbursement for face-to-face for non-face-to-face -face visits and lack of healthcare system supported platforms that met HIPAA requirements. Also post-COVID, surveys indicate the impact of COVID on nutrition-related behaviors include increased food insecurity, stress eating, binge eating, weight gain, and current concerns related to poor COVID-related outcomes for those with diabetes. Some healthcare agencies deem their dietitians as essential workers and their workloads increased. Others were furloughed or assigned to non-nutrition work. We found that virtual nutrition visits were one way to answer providing nutrition care during the pandemic. HIPAA waivers allowed dietitians to use several virtual platforms, allowing them to match the platform to the patient's skills and comfort. We found it resulted in lower no-show rates and increased engagement for some patients. Other patients still wanted face-to-face -face visits. We learned that virtual visits did not meet the needs of all. To ensure all patients receive equal nutrition care access, other efforts were needed to limit disparities. Access to internet varies greatly by race and geography. Our answer was to use telephone visits combined with mailing the educational materials to keep patients engaged. Prior to COVID, ECU Family Medicine delivered an in-person weight management program designed for people who lacked resources to participate in traditional weight management programs. 
It included a monthly cooking program in which the participants were able to see a healthy recipe prepared, taste it, and take the ingredients home to prepare for their families. We transitioned our teaching to a virtual platform with videos for cooking, and again, not all could access. We contacted these patients by phone to arrange for a monthly drive-through grocery pickup with recipes provided and phone support. Dietitians worked with the farmer's market to obtain food for classes during a time when grocery stores were limiting quantities of food that could be purchased. Our colleagues at NC State also faced challenges in the delivery of their diabetes prevention program. Face-to-face -face program participants initially signed up because they didn't have access to technology or they didn't have computer skills or they wanted social interaction. Dietitians helped clients using, to find user-friendly virtual platforms and created a participant Facebook page for social interaction. And they created a patient portal for private feedback for participants. Our school telehealth team typically reaches students who do not have technology or internet at home, but they do have access at school. Dietitians involved in the Healthier Lives at School and Beyond program did not want to lose the momentum that they had developed with their students prior to COVID. They contacted families to determine how to meet their needs. Many requested budget-friendly recipes, shopping lists for local stores, and weekly newsletters, which were all provided. The Pitt County Health Department dietitians moved to assure that WIC participants were aware of the changes that allowed them to now receive benefits that were previously only available by coming to the health department. They used the phone and email to alert their participants and to provide nutrition education curbside pickup and drop off of breast pumps were offered. You can read all about meeting the challenges of providing nutrition services during a pandemic in our article published in January, the January, February issue of Nutrition Today. Hello everyone, my name is Brandon Stroud and I am a senior in the Department of Nutrition Science at East Carolina University. Today I will be discussing with you the Farm to Clinic program and why the program is so important. National data shows that fewer than one in 10 Americans eat an adequate amount of fruits and vegetables each day. A healthier diet for adults is essential to put them at a lower risk for obesity, heart disease, type two diabetes, and certain cancers. A healthy diet also helps to manage chronic illnesses and prevent further complications. This is a major public health concern and something that we as healthcare professionals should be working to address. Now, poor diet quality is often linked to food insecurity. Food insecurity is where individuals don't have enough access to food, typically healthy food. Now, you may be asking who is at most risk for food insecurity? The people who are most at risk for food insecurity is low income populations. These low income populations usually are at a higher risk for food insecurity, exhibit poor diet quality, and are at higher risk for health disparities. So produce prescription programs have been developed over the last couple years to help deal with these issues. Produce prescription programs are defined as programs where medical professionals prescribe, no, not medicine, fresh produce to individuals to help them deal with diet-related chronic illnesses. Now, Farm to Clinic is considered a produce prescription program. However, we have developed a sustainable model that is much different than others in the past. This sustainable model is not grant funded like some of the other ones that ends when the grant runs out. Our program is ran completely by student volunteers and through a partnership with the Society of St. Andrews and the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. This sustainable model allows us as student volunteers to travel to fields who have already been picked over for marketable produce, and we take unmarketable but edible produce and transport it directly to the clinics. We also transport any excess produce that the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina has 
to these clinics as well. Now the clinics we partner with all fall under the umbrella of the North Carolina Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. The reason we chose to partner with these clinics is because they provide for low income patient populations that usually are at a higher risk for food insecurity and health disparities. The Farm to Clinic program began in the fall of 2019 as a small pilot program that provided produce for roughly 30 patients. Now, over this past year, our program has grown vastly through our developed relationships with the Society of St. Andrews and the Food Bank. This fall alone, we were able to provide 885 patients with 5,064 pounds of produce. Now, this is not all that we have planned with this program. In 2021, we have some very big plans for Farm to Clinic. We will be offering a program called Fresh Start, which is a lifestyle intervention health coaching program where we will be coaching diabetic patients on how to better manage their diabetes. We will be setting weekly goals for physical activity to increase it, to increase fruit and vegetable intake and decrease sugar sweetened beverage intake. This is very important because we can look at these measures through their hemoglobin A1C levels, as well as help them manage their diabetes better. Now, the larger program that we will be running in the summer to fall of 2021 will be one of the largest produce prescription programs ever ran. This program will be ran for 24 weeks and will help to address many health disparities and have many different evaluations. COVID-19 has been a big issue throughout 2020. It has caused a lot of people to lose their jobs and in that lose their health insurance. Through the Farm to Clinic program, we have been providing people with fresh produce who have lost their health insurance and have had to recently go to the free and charitable clinics. People with diabetes are at a much higher risk for comorbidities as well as complications if they do not have good glycemic management. That is why good glycemic management is essential and something that we've worked to address. Now that is all I have to say, thank you.